We left off at verse 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So notice it says in this verse, he hath on his vesture. Okay, so he hath his vesture, his clothes, right? So he hath on his vesture and on his thigh, right over here, right? And then it's a name that's written King of kings and Lord of lords. So if it's like his vesture here and then on his thigh over here with a name written, it may be like this. It may be like this. That's also possible. And then it'll go King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Why? Because he is worthy. And he's going to conquer his foes and his enemies. Amen. And so remember, as he comes down, it's like his honeymoon. And just like his honeymoon, he dashes his enemies into pieces. Why? Because his enemies consist of the Antichrist army. And then blood will reach at the bottom of the hem of his garments, if you recall. And then, as he comes down in his white horse, you are following down with him. And as you follow down with him, he has a sash with words written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's where Handel's Messiah gets it from. So when Handel was singing the song, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, you got to realize that was actually at the wrong dispensation. Some people think that that's today. No, that's the wrong dispensation. Handel's song is actually applicable for this timeline. For this timeline. That's where Handel's famous Hallelujah Chorus will be sung. When he conquers his enemies. It's referring to that timeline where he's known as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that's where the Antichrist, the infamous man of sin, he will be conquered. And then he is known as the false Christ with proclaiming peace when in reality there is no peace. Yeah. And if you recall at Revelation chapter 6, he is holding a bow. He is holding a bow. All right, let's keep reading over here. We're going to read chapter 19, verse 17. And I saw an angel, so John sees an angel, standing in the sun. Okay, so notice over here, John sees an angel that's standing in the sun. Now go to 1 Corinthians 15 now. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, what could be going on then is this, is that the angel is like literally standing on the sun. And you'll notice that the sun, a star or a planet or however way you want to call it, but the point is, is that when it comes to like objects in outer space, stars, planets, etc., you'll notice that there's a tying with an angel to that or a celestial body. That is very, very interesting. That hence, people talk about UFOs in outer space, right? Where they get that idea from. Well, alien obviously means a person that's not of this world. That's the idea about an alien. So an alien who is not of this planet, Earth, but of where? Some other different planet over there. And those so-called aliens are actually fallen angels. You understand. Because notice how angels are tied to suns or planets. Look at verse 40. Verse 40. 1 Corinthians 15, 40. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So the celestial body, right? See, heavenly bodies. Those that are not earthly bodies. A.K.A. alien bodies. See that? There is, verse 41... Okay, verse 40 talks about terrestrial, right? But see, we're talking about extraterrestrials right there. Different. Let's look at verse 41. There is one glory. What is the celestial body or these ETs? Glory of the what? Sun. And another glory of the moon. And another glory of the what? Stars. For what? One star differeth from another star in glory. Look at that. So then let's return back to Revelation 19, the main text, Revelation 19. So then, oops, I went above the line over there. Oh, well, it's okay. It's okay. The camera didn't have to be moved, so don't worry. 
But anyway, the angel is literally like standing in the sun. And because I can't put the angel on top of the sun, uh, because onliners don't see it, I'm just going to have to draw it here. All right. Now remember, angels do not have wings for people who don't know. Uh, video on angels but anyway aside from that this angel I'm just drawing it with wings for the sake of uh, uh, artistic representation so that people don't get confused because I'm gonna draw a man down here obviously so it just makes the distinction more clear that way okay so then uh, the angel over here is standing on top of the Sun and it could be more literal than you think, actually. It could be more literal than you think. That shows what kind of body we're going to have. Remember, our bodies are like angel's body, right? Angelic body. Uh, we covered that at the book of Joel, chapter 2. We glanced through that at our last Revelation study. And we also talked about being a... We are going to be the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ. So see, it's literally a Superman angelic body. Very close, angels are close to the angel of the Lord, and we're likened to the angels of heaven. Angels are called sons of God. We're also called sons of God. And angels, their bodies, it, can, it, is, oh, it is so interesting, they're tied to stars or planets. Oh, another example is go to Revelation 1. Revelation chapter 1. Verse 20. Verse 20. This was mentioned a little bit at our last Revelation study, but let's repeat Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars, right? Which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the what? Angels of the seven churches. It's always connected weirdly somehow. All right, go back to your text. Go back to your text. That's why Satan and his minions... They want to overrule all the other planets and stars throughout outer space. Why? Because they want to take that territory for themselves. But that territory is reserved for God's good angels. And we are likened to the angels of heaven. It's for his sons of gods, not the fallen sons of God. Okay, let's look back at Revelation 19. So that's pretty interesting. If this angel has the glory of the sun according to 1 Corinthians 15, then imagine... This angel having the power of the sun. Is that possible? Well, uh, didn't we look at something very interesting at Revelation, oh, was it chapter 10? Yeah, Revelation 10, a mighty angel, glory of a sun. Joel chapter 2, they leave fire behind him. We're going to have the power of basically Mars, Venus, Mercury, sun and moon and stars. Can you imagine that? Dude, this is a kind of body that God gives to you for free and it's so amazing people don't want it and there are so many elitists and globalists that want to live immortal that spend billions if not trillions of dollars in their whole life their power and blood so that they can have this kind of immortal body that's temporary and still earthly and can die but God gives it to you for free how about that that means, see, you're truly blessed more than any rich person in the entire universe. Because the richest of the rich, the elitest of the elites, they're all trying to buy. They're all trying to buy more life. All right, Revelation 19. Let's keep reading here. So the angel stands in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice. So he cries with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, so he's crying so that he can speak, say, to all the birds, fowls that are flying in heaven, right? Come and gather yourselves together. So he's telling them to assemble unto the supper of the great God. Because they have a big feast and a big supper. Ooh, really? Yeah, this supper and this great feast is actually referring to bodies. So all these birds are going to come down from the skies and what they want is they actually want the bodies. Their supper is actually the bodies of all these men, all these men who died in the battle of Armageddon. That's a huge feast because we're talking about millions upon millions of people actually. Verse 18. 
uh, verse 17 says, Supper of the Great God. You notice that? Supper of the Great God. So this is God's Supper. Now, I don't know if you recall, this is called Supper of the Great God. It was also called, if you recall, look at a couple verses behind. It's called Supper of the Great God. And it's also called, verse 15, Wine Press. Remember that? It's the Supper of God. And it's also known as the wine press. Now, I don't know if you paid attention to today's sermon, Luke 22. Go to Luke 22. Let me show you something interesting. Luke chapter 22. We all partake in the Lord's Supper as a church, which is the grape juice and then unleavened bread. When we partake in that, it is a representation of not just of Christ's first coming, which is his death when he died on the cross and shed his blood. It is also a representation and a symbol of his second coming. His second coming, which is what? When he conquers his enemies. Let me show you Luke chapter 22, verse 15. This is something we didn't really pay attention to. Oh, pastor was just preaching a message. It was a good message. Oh, there's something doctrinal that you overlooked. Verse 15, And he said unto them, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Okay, he wants to eat the supper with them. Hence, it's called the Last Supper, right? Of Jesus. Look at this. For I say unto you, I will not eat any more thereof. So Jesus is no longer able to eat this supper with them until what? It be fulfilled in the what? Kingdom of God. God's, when God sets up his kingdom here and reigns as king of kings and lord of lords, that supper is going to initiate that. The wine too. Look at this. Look at verse 18. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. What is this known as? The wine press. Until the kingdom of God shall come. Woo! All right, go to 1 Corinthians 11. Look what Paul says about the Lord's Supper that we eat. We're doing it in remembrance of not just Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. It should also be done where you're contemplating his, his coming as well. His coming. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Dr. Ruckman once said, in his debate against uh, a famous Catholic apologist, Carl Keating, he mentioned to him, you know, in the Catholic Mass, I wonder if they ever mention about the Lord's second coming. Did you guys ever do that? It should be done. That's how you properly partake in the Lord's Supper. Because look at this, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, the Lord's Supper, ye do what? Show the Lord's death, what, till what? Till he come. His coming. His coming is necessary. So notice over here that this is often done because it's supposed to represent the second coming of Christ. Why? Because the supper of the great God, which is the bodies, the bodies of the slain, the fallen, the Antichrist army. Their slaughter, their weapons are done for. Jesus Christ, with just the very sword that comes out of his mouth, he just conquers his enemies. He conquers his enemies and wipes them out. Amen. And this is known as the supper and the wine press. Why? I'll tell you why. Because they did something to our Lord and Savior a long time ago. You think that the Lord forgotten it? You think that you don't reap what you sow? What did mankind do with their sins? I'll tell you what, man. They spat on the Lord Jesus Christ. They beat his body. And they cursed and blasphemed his name. And God remember every beating of that. And God says, okay, this, the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is symbolized through the Last Supper. Why? Because of what mankind did to the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So God, he's going to get vengeance in return. I'm going to get your body and your blood, and that's going to be my supper. 
That's why, <laughs> amen, brother, you better repent. God gave you 2,000 plus years, right? That's, right? That's a lot of time, friend. He's given you nearly 2,000 plus years and payday's coming. Yeah. You want to take this one. Look, if you're not going to partake in the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, and what I mean by that is I don't mean the unleavened bread or the grape juice. Look at the book of John 5. Look at the book of John 5. It's when you, get, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, what happens to you? You become part of the body of Christ, right? right. See, that means if you're part of the body of Christ, you're already a part of His body and blood. See, you're intaking, you're nourished with His body and blood. That's what, we, that's what I mean about concerning salvation for the body and blood of Christ, is that if you eat and drink of His body and blood spiritually, see, it's a spiritual salvation. If you refuse that, He's going to get the body and blood either way. Now, which one you want? Look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Notice verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, every time the Lord Jesus Christ partook in a feast, he knew that what it would represent later on, you got to understand. Now, look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Look at verse 53. Verse 53, John chapter 6, verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. And what is that? That's believing on the Son. It's not talking about the Mass because notice what God says at verse 35, 35. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that what cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall what? Never thirst. See, it's when you come to Christ and believe on him, you are partaking in his body and blood.